Give you a very warm and special welcome to our Monday Thursday communion service, and it's lovely uh, for us at um, St Blaine's to welcome our friends from Lecrot and also our friends from Dumbling Cathedral as well. It's great to have uh, the choir with us. And if I thought ahead a bit more, then we should have had a combined choir, but we know that for next year um, when when we're both thinking about the the Easter services, but it's lovely to have you here tonight as well. So a warm welcome to you all to our service. Uh, when, we're, um, doing the, when we're engaged in the act of communion itself, there are on the trays some plastic pots, I believe, with gluten-free bread, and we do hope that we have enough of that for you tonight. Maybe we've uh, miscalculated, we'll wait and see. But um, that's where to find it, if that's what you need. Uh, this evening. So a warm welcome to you all. And we're going to uh, uh, sing our first hymn together. It's hymn 130. Hymn 130, ye servants of God, your masters proclaim. <laughs> Oh, 
friends, we bow our heads and quieten our hearts as we gather together in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, worshipped by the angels of heaven, thinking of that scene from the prophet Isaiah chapter 6. Above him were seraph, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. <laughs> Father, we thank you that you are worshipped and adored in heaven. And by your people on this earth, it is the same. We worship you and adore you with our voices raised. Glad to be gathered as your people on this Monday, Thursday. And Father, we know what is to come after the scene in the upper room. We know there's the garden and the betrayal and the denial. And Father, we confess to you that we, like Judas and Peter, have gone astray with our thoughts, with our words, with the things that we've done. And we seek your forgiveness this night. We ask that you lift us up from the depth of sin and restore us through the one who will go to the cross on our behalf, through the one who will say the words, it is finished. And so, Father, be with us tonight, we pray. Join us together in holy communion. Help us to know your presence and the price that was prayed. And Father, as we pray, we remember and speak the words of Jesus' prayer, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us listen for the word of God as it is contained in the Gospel according to John, chapter 13, and reading from verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, 
You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? he asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. <coughs> When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my, dis my disciples if you love one another. Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading from his holy word. We sing the hymn, hymn 710, I Have a Dream a Man Once Said. <laughs>
Having spent very nearly 10 years living in the Cathedral Manse and being tempted to think that the area around the Cathedral is the centre of the universe, <laughs> I checked my car sat-nav to discover how to get to St Blaine's. <laughs> I was intrigued at the information it provided and even more intrigued at the information it omitted. It told me how to find the Tappet Hen. <laughs> that I knew already. <laughs> it told me to, how to find the Beech Tree Cafe. That too I knew already, having had a bacon butty with Andrew there earlier today, at his expense. <laughs> but don't feel that St. Blaine's is being singled out for special omission here. It didn't mention Dumbling Cathedral either. And I wondered, is it a sad sign of the times? Told me how to get to the pub and the cafe, but no church. Is it a sad sign of the times indicating that church is much less relevant to people than the Tappet Hen and the Beech Tree? For many, that might be the case, although quite a number of people managed both through the cathedral and the Tappet Hen. I'm not saying who. <laughs> the choir knows who they are. <laughs> the inclusion of places of hospitality on Satnav and the absence of a place of worship did set me thinking, because hospitality should not be confined to pubs and cafes. Hospitality should be at the very heart of what the church is about and at the heart of its worship, its whole life. Church should be about creating a safe space in which people can sense that they're valued simply as the people they are, no matter their present circumstances, their past mistakes, their future prospects. And if you read through the four gospels, you will see Jesus again and again doing just that, creating a safe space in which people can feel valued, knowing that they are truly being listened to and taken seriously, giving a boost to their self-respect and their sense of worth. You will remember the encounter between Jesus and a woman at a well in Samaria. That was a highly dodgy thing to do in the eyes of the religious elite of the day, because no self-respecting Jewish man would engage in prolonged discussion with a woman he didn't know. And it was worse. She was a Samaritan woman, belonging to that group of people with whom Jewish people then wouldn't associate. And worse still, she was a woman with a reputation. And yet even worse, she asked them for a drink of water. And even the woman herself was astonished and questioned it. How many rules could Jesus break in just that one encounter? In the eyes of the Unca Good, the religious who were fastidious about traditions and rules, this was a scandalous encounter. And for her, it was a transforming one. And for Jesus too, it was a pivotal point in his ministry because that woman, a non-Jew with a reputation, became one of the first missionaries. Somebody who went out and told others about this remarkable man whom she perceived to be the Messiah. And all because for her, Jesus created that surprising safe space for an encounter when in all probability, all she'd encountered at that well before would be the scorn and the rejection and the harsh judgment of others. Safe, safe spaces and true hospitality are, I believe, much more fundamental to the Christian faith and to worship than many of us tend to think. Eating together isn't simply a social function, which of course it is, but it is an expression of good religious practice. The Jewish people were encouraged to remember their deliverance from slavery in Egypt, not through a lecture or a ceremony, alone, but through a meal, the Passover meal, a meal that Jesus himself observed as a Jew. Remembering what was being done, not through a sermon nor through a lecture, 
but within the context of a meal. A meal with elements within the menu and the practice especially designed to remind them of that night when under the cover of darkness the Israelites were able finally to escape from long years of misery and slavery that had been their lot. And there to remember, not in order that they might be a perpetually embittered people, but a people whose disposition was one of gratitude and positivity. Somebody once wrote, if you want to preserve freedom, never forget what it is like to lose it. They were to be a people of gratitude and positivity. And meals remained important for Jesus, who spent more of his ministry eating and drinking with people than we might tend to think. Which is why when I go and have a bacon butty with Andrew, I feel I'm working. <laughs> it's hard work, you know, having a bacon butty with him. We find him eating in the home of Simon the Pharisee and the home of Martha and Mary. The feeding of the great crowd too was a meal, a picnic on a vast scale at which he demonstrated God's concern that people be fed. And he demonstrated too the sheer power of people being prepared to offer up even the little they had, a young lad with his picnic of loaves and fishes. And of course, there is that meal that we have gathered to share this Monday, Thursday. Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Again it happened, again, round a meal table. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at table with the twelve. It wasn't the quiet, serene meal that the disciples might have expected. For it was at that meal table that Jesus shocked them again. He told them that somebody was about to betray him. <coughs> and it was at that meal table Jesus reminded them about what was going to happen to him, something of which he had spoken before, even if they failed to understand. And while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And giving thanks, as we know so well, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And he took a cup of wine, giving thanks for that too, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. <coughs> now, why did this happen in the context of a meal? Yes, it was the Passover. It was part of the tradition. The story is the people of God. And Jesus did it partly because they hadn't really grasped it before, I'm sure. But also, he wanted to put it into context. He wanted them to see that his impending death, how awful, terrifying, unfair and bewildering it would seem to be, was still something that was in God's hands. Good would come out of it because of his death and his rising there'd be new beginnings and a gospel of hope and forgiveness and life to share God's love could not be destroyed or swayed even by the most awful events and Jesus wanted to, them to remember that this was their deliverance just as the Israelites had been delivered from slavery in Egypt but perhaps it was also in the context of a meal, simply because when people are seated around a table sharing food and drink, they're united that bit more than usual. Each is involved, perhaps that less, bit less distracted, that bit more able to take on board what is being said. It was Kofi Annan when Secretary General of the United Nations that insisted that before any serious discussions began, participants should always sit around a table and share a meal. And I believe there's deep wisdom and God-given wisdom in that. And I know from experience 
especially when I was convener of the World Mission Council of the Church of Scotland, that when we shared meals all over the world, barriers began to fall. Be it with religious leaders of all traditions in Syria, or the heads of churches in Lebanon, or an iftar meal with Muslim leaders in Pakistan, or staff and volunteers in relief agencies in Gaza, or peacemakers from Jewish, Muslim, and Christian communities in a deeply divided Jerusalem. Meeting around a meal table was always more fruitful and relaxed than in serried ranks in a conference. Somehow the conversation flowed more easily. <clears throat> Differences seemed that le less, bit less threatening. And because we're doing something so universally human as eating and drinking, we did have a deeper sense of our shared humanity. Hospitality, whenever given or accepted, can be such a powerful thing. But we know that already. Which is why we stress that the communion table that is set before us tonight is open to all. Not simply the members of any one church or tradition, but to all who sincerely want to discover more of the grace and the inclusive love of God, who come with hands outstretched and hearts open. And it's why so many of us felt so bereft during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, when we couldn't meet together around tables and we couldn't invite others to join us. Zoom drinks are not quite the same thing. But there was more than a meal that evening. There was also the startling spectacle of Jesus stripped of his outer garments, foreshadowing what was going to happen perhaps in a day or so, donning a towel and kneeling to wash the feet of his disciples. That was something startling, shocking evening. evening. And it also begs a question. Why did Jesus spend his last night on earth teaching his disciples to wash feet and to share supper. Surely he had lists to give them, instructions, blueprints, blueprint for how the Church of Scotland should be structured. I don't think there was anything further from Jesus' mind than that, but anyway. <laughs> With all the conceptual truths of the universe at his disposal, he didn't simply give them something to think about or debate when he was gone, or there was plenty. Instead, he gave them concrete things to do. Wash one another's feet. Do the things that show you care about people and value their humanity. Feed them. Share your bread and your wine with them in order that they may remember him and know something of his love in their midst. He gave his disciples something to do something to get their hands on that required them to get close enough to touch one another, low enough that they couldn't look down on one another, to sit alongside one another as equals without rushing on or walking away. Wash one another's feet, break the bread, and share it. Take the wine and share it. And he said, do this, not simply believe this or discuss this, but do this in remembrance of me. I suspect that important though thought and study and preaching and teaching are, and they are, people are often more influenced by the washing of feet, maybe not literally, but the kindness, the practical help, the getting alongside people, the stooping down to be with them. I remember somebody saying that what struck them as when they were a young child in the streets of Edinburgh was to see Lord George MacLeod in all his kit as moderator of the General Assembly looking a little like Dick Turpin sitting there with his knee breeches and his frills and his tail frock coat, sitting in the gutter 
on the pavement beside them, talking to them, and then kicking a football around with them. He was a great orator, but that is what made the impression. Jesus said, do this. Wash one another's feet. Share the bread. Share the wine. In remembrance of him. As we've sung, words alone don't ease the pain. They're valuable. But actions can be even more so. Amen. And thanks be to God. We sing again hymn 376. Is it? it was on the night when doomed to know. To the tune ye banks and braes. <laughs> Now the choir.
friends, some words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, peace, I give you peace, I leave with you. Not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Let us pray. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Father God, who so loved the world, we pray for the hungry today in different places in the world, some on our own doorsteps. And as we pray, we think of the work of Startup Sterling. Or we think of places further off. Gaza. People being deprived of food and water the very basics of life. Or we hear of places in West Africa where crops have failed and prices rise. And so as we remember our friends there, Father, we give thanks for the work of Christian aid, bringing help all over the world. Father, we remember our call to welcome the stranger, the task to offer hospitality, friendship to the friendless, and the real challenge of that task. And we remember, as we've heard tonight of that meal in the upper room, Jesus sitting with his friends, thinking of what was to come, knowing he would be betrayed and denied. We think of those who are sick. We remember those recovering from surgery here in our own congregation here in St. Blaine's and also those who are in hospital from the La Croft congregation at this time. But we remember all of our congregations in the grouping with those who are in need, those who are struggling right now with ill health. And Father, for those who have good health, we thank you for that blessing that comes from you. Father, we remember those words, again, I was in prison and you came to visit me. We think of prisoners doing time, those who have committed serious crimes and those who have got in with the wrong crowd. Heavenly Father, be with them and their families. We do pray that those who are in prison might see a change of heart, that change might come. We know that you can change hearts, Lord God. And so we pray tonight, not just for prisoners, but for their chaplains and the work and witness done there the acts of kindness. Father, your word calls us to pray for those who govern us. And we know that those who govern us face difficult and challenging issues. And we pray for our MSPs in the coming weeks. 
as they think about the assisted dying bill. And the trial of thinking that through. And the division. And people being torn with different experiences. But Father, we remember that you breathe life into us. That you know every day that we have. From beginning to end. And to you we give thanks this day. And Father, we set apart this bread and this wine from its common use to that heavenly mystery that the Lord Jesus Christ instituted on that night. Join our hearts together, not just here on earth, but with the saints in heaven. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. And friends, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink from it, do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Friends, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
Let's give one another the peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Mark. Peace be with you, my friend. Bless you. Peace be with you. Father, we thank you for this sacrament of peace and love and sacrifice. And Lord, we give thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ did not stop in the upper room, but made his way to the garden. Lord, be with him. Strengthen him for what is to come. This we ask and pray in his name. Amen. <coughs> well, it's been great to um, have everyone together for communion tonight. It's a real joy. And I know what a great joy it's been for, and a, an encouragement it's been uh, for Colin and I as we've shared services Monday through uh, to Thursday. And um, uh, we've been very encouraged uh, to see so many folk each night. So tomorrow night... Uh, there's a service at the cathedral at half past seven. There's um, some reflective things going on. Words from the cross at 2 p.m. in the cathedral. And the 12 o'clock, 12 till 2. Don't turn up at 2. Turn up at 12. <laughs> and then uh, also we have a service for uh, ourselves here at Le Cropt at half past seven as well. And then do you have a quiet day on Saturday? Do you have a service? 7.30 on Saturday evening. I don't have a service. <laughs> so I wish you well, my friend. And um, Easter morning, 6.30, if, for the, those who are fit, up the Damayat, 7.30 in the rock garden next to the river, and then the normal times for our services after that on Easter day. And um, if you're coming to breakfast, <laughs> let the folks at the cathedral know. Um, it helps them in terms of organisation. But we sing together our final hymn, hymn 377, 377, Go to Dark Gethsemane.
thoughtfulness, reverence, peace. And with the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and all you remember and love, now and always.